So, hello, my name is Ben Rossett. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I am, I'm really excited about this. This is really cool, uh, the design of play. Um, it's great that you guys get to take a class like this. When I was in college, there was nothing like this. I was taking classes called post-colonial literature and introduction to Dutch. Uh, so, um, so this is really cool, and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so my talk today is called So You Want to Be a Game Designer, and we'll get to that and why I chose uh, that title uh, in a little while. But first, I wanted to get a sense of kind of where you guys are as game designers yourself. Um, so who would say, is anyone brave enough to volunteer before this class? So before this class, had anyone designed a game before? Yes. What kind of game did you design? Uh, I designed an Android game. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Android application. Okay, so digital game, Android app. Anybody else? Who else said, would say they designed a game for this class? Well, I, I did a game jam a couple months ago. Right. Uh, in addition, I've gotten some games previously that were not too dissimilar. Okay. Game makers. Okay. And you've done card games, right? And, and during the class, I designed a card game. You've designed a card game. Very cool. Okay. Um, and, okay, so, um, and who would say that, so after this class, after this semester, who's interested in continuing to design games? Who thinks that they'll try to continue designing games after this class? <laughs> Don't worry, Professor Grace isn't gonna know if your hand's going. <laughs> um, okay, so, and how about tabletop games? So we've, this, this class is mostly focused on um, some theory, but working with, with tabletop board and card games, right? Okay. So you've all been designing board games for this class, board or card games? What's that? Okay. Yeah. What's that? You can, do you, you can do what you want. I think it's half, oh, okay. half divided. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, okay. So who has dreamed about being a famous game designer one day? Anybody? <laughs> Where? Where everybody knows your game and you've got the hottest new game. Who wants to be that designer? Nobody? Come on. I want to be that designer. I definitely want to be that designer. Um, it's definitely one of the reasons why I got into designing games. I mean, I love it and I love creating games. But yeah, I definitely dreamed and fantasized about being like the hottest new game designer. Um, and I think that that, you know, that that can actually happen. Um, particularly if you are interested in tabletop games board and card games, um, being a famous tabletop designer is actually possible now. Um, and my evidence is the coolest t-shirt ever, okay? Does anybody know these words and these names and what's on this t-shirt? Anybody recognize any of that? Okay, has anybody played Settlers of Catan before? Yep, a couple hands going up. All right, so that's Klaus Tuber right there, who designed Settlers of Catan. Has anybody played Ticket to Ride before? All right, so this t-shirt is full of famous board game designers, okay? These are all names of famous board game designers. And this is actually um, for sale on a website now. Board games are becoming cool enough where uh, some company is selling t-shirts with the names of, four, of famous board game designers. And really, I mean, this is, um, you know, this is really one of the, my dream, right? The reason why I got into designing board games is so one day, like, you know, my name's <laughs> big at the top of the shirt, right? I mean, if, if that ever happens, I know I've made it. I can pretty much retire as a, as a board game designer. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been designing board games and card games since about 2007, 2008. Um, and I definitely did dream of getting published as a designer when I started designing. Um, I've done a few things wrong over that time, but I've done a lot more things right. And I've been lucky enough that I have one uh, published game that's available with two more that are under contract and gonna be out this summer, uh, with hopefully more on the way after that. Um, but before 2007, 2008, uh, I really wasn't even a strategy game player. I didn't play a lot of board games. I didn't know a lot of board games. I wouldn't even have really considered myself particularly a creative person back then. Um, 
So, and I didn't grow up in a gaming family where I played board games and card games every night, you know, after dinner with my family or anything like that. Uh, and I probably haven't read any game design theory books that someone in this class hasn't read. So I'm not here today to talk to you about the theory of games or design theory uh, or MDA or anything like that. I'm here today uh, to talk to you guys. Professor Grace is much more qualified to talk to you guys about all that. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about um, getting published as a designer and uh, being particularly a, a tabletop game designer and if it's something that you're interested in, uh, what's worked for me and to let you know that um, this is actually possible. It's actually possible to get uh, published as a game designer, particularly board and card game designer today. Um, and to, let you, to share with you some of the things that's worked for me and if you're interested, hopefully those things can work for you as well. All right, sound good? Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, one thing uh, about all that dreaming, about getting published, and all that kind of fantasizing about that is it can get kind of addictive. Um, so, game design is pretty much on my mind at all times uh, these days. This is just one iPhone note that I have on my phone. When I walk around during the day and I get an idea for a game, I pull out my phone, and that's usually the first thing I do is I put a little note in my phone, just an idea about the game. This is just one note from like, you know, the last couple of months or something, ideas that I've come up with. Um, this is, these are the notes that I took during a conference call at my real job last week. Um, you know, I was on the, on the phone on a conference call and of course all that was going through my mind was the last playtest I had done of a game that I'm working on called Homebrewers. Uh, and so these are, um, you know, things that came to my mind about my last playtest and changes I wanted to make to the game. So these were my notes from my conference call last week. Don't tell my boss. Uh, and then here's me in my morning meditation, you know, ohm worker placement and, and um, uh, game design just always on my mind uh, these days. So it gets a little addictive, but in, uh, in the best of ways. Okay, so uh, what's in store for today? Well, we're gonna get, um, I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about getting started in tabletop design. If it's something that you're interested in, designing board games, designing card games, kind of how to get going and how to start doing that, how to, how to jump into design. Um, becoming a better designer, and then increasing your chances of getting published if that's something that you guys are uh, indeed interested in and have as a goal. Um, then we're gonna take a little bit of a break and then we'll do a design activity where I brought uh, some games in and we'll kind of workshop some, some games together and fix some games and kind of make them better. All right, how's that sound? Okay, so if you guys have any questions, please feel free to stop me during the presentation um, and we can answer those as we go. Uh, I also brought um, some, some gifts and some handouts for you guys. Um, so after the presentation and after the break, I'll hand those out. Um, I also have some discounts uh, to get games at discounted rates online from a couple of publishers um, and a few other prizes and stuff. So we'll, we'll kind of get to that as we go through the presentation and get into the design activity, all right? Okay, so um, getting started. So what we're going to talk about here is designing for yourself. Um, top-down versus bottom-up design, which is also known as theme first versus mechanics first. Making it easy on yourself. Finding a design group and engaging the design community. Okay, designing for yourself. Um, this is a picture I found online about a, a, it's a zombie pirate or zombie pirate ninja or something like that. Um, I'm working with a couple other designers right now on kind of some projects together, and we were brainstorming ideas about uh, you know, what, what games we want to make. Um, and one of his ideas was, um, how about a, a, zombie, a zombie pirate game where you're like raiding old pirate ships, um, and right, you're like zombie pirates. And I said, you know what? There's, there's a lot of zombie games out right now, but that's, that doesn't interest me, right? Zombie pirates don't interest me. So, no, I'm not interested in making a zombie pirate game because that's not the kind of game I want to design. That's really not where my heart is. So, so zombie pirates are not for me. Um, I also have uh, friends that have kids and they have little girls 
and they've asked me before, could I design a My Little Pony game for their eight-year-old girls? And I said, well, thank you very much for asking, that's really sweet, but no, I can't design a My Little Pony game for you. And it's not because there's anything wrong with My Little Pony or because I couldn't actually do it, but I have no interest in My Little Pony, and so designing a game about My Little Pony, my heart's not going to be in it. It's not going to be something that I'm really engaged in. And so this is the first thing that I've learned as a tabletop designer, is that you need to design for yourself. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with zombie pirate games, there's nothing wrong with My Little Pony games, but for me, that's not what's going to make me successful as a designer, because that's not what my heart is into. Um, so what my heart is into is something like this. This is um, my game called So You Want to Be a Game Designer, and that's where the name of my talk comes from today. A couple of years ago, I actually designed a board game about designing board games and trying to get published. And now at the time, that's what I was trying to do. I was designing board games and I was trying to get published as a board game designer. Um, and so this was a really smart thing for me to do for a couple reasons. Number one, obviously I love the topic, right? So I was really engaged in it, my heart was really in it, I was really excited about making a game about designing board games. Now, I've pitched this idea to a number of different publishers and none of them think it's a good idea. None of them think that this is a marketable idea for a board game. I think they're wrong. I mean, if there's room on the market for 500 different zombie games, there's room for one about designing board games. But even if I'm wrong and they're right, this was still an incredibly smart thing for me to do. Um, because at this time, um, you know, I was hoping to get published. I had pitched a couple games to a couple publishers and I hadn't gotten uh, picked up and signed yet any of my games, but designing something like this really kind of kept me going and, and fueled me through that process, right? And um, Because I was so emotionally connected to, the own, to my game that I was making, that even if it didn't get published right away, or even if I wasn't getting great feedback from designers, I was still having fun and I was still happy doing what I was doing. And so it didn't become a, I wasn't designing games that it felt like a job because I had to get published and I'm designing this game just because it's the hot new thing, even though I'm not really interested in the topic and I really, really want to get it published. So when you're designing for yourself, uh, you're designing with your heart as well as designing with your head. Um, and, it, and, and doing something like this can really sustain you through um, yeah, through trying to get published if that's what something you're interested in, even if it's not happening right away. So have fun with it and design for yourself is the number one, probably most important thing that I can tell you guys today um, in terms of being game designers. Um, the other reason why this was uh, really smart of me to make is because it forced me to actually look at the things I was doing as a tabletop game designer to try to get published, right? And am I doing the right things that I think I need to be doing, right? So I kind of modeled that world in this game and said, well, maybe I actually could be doing this better. Maybe I could be doing this differently. Um, and it wasn't too long after this um, that, that my first game did get uh, picked up and published. Um, so this game, So You Want to Be a Game Designer, is still on the back shelf for me. Um, I would love to get it published one day. But if not, that's fine and still totally worthwhile my time to make something like this. Okay, so um, theme first versus mechanics first. Um, you'll hear this also um, referred to as top-down design versus bottom-up design. Um, so first of all, those terms, kind of theme and mechanics, everyone's comfortable with those terms. Uh, does there any questions about what I mean when I say theme first versus mechanics first? Okay, okay, great. So um, in the board and card game space, there are a lot of successful mechanics first designers. Um, some of the names that you may have heard of, Reiner Knizia, Stefan Feld, very famous, they were both on that t-shirt, very famous uh, board game designers who would be considered mechanics first designers, right? Um, the themes of their games are not really strongly tied to the way the game plays and the rules of the games, but they've been very successful kind of designing, um, designing a system and then kind of putting a theme on top of that. So there's nothing particularly wrong with that. 
but I tried it and I don't recommend it. So as a newer game designer, um, come on in. Um, particularly if you're working in the tabletop board game, kind of card game space, uh, I would recommend uh, trying to be, trying to start out as, an, as a theme first designer. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that. First of all, it limits your scope of what you're trying to design, right? So if you're trying to design a game about designing board games, right away the scope of the gameplay is limited because there are certain things that are just not going to be part of that game. So you can kind of put those out of your head right away. So it helps to kind of focus you as a designer to have a theme for the game, a strong theme in mind when you start. Um, I think it's easier for players to learn and understand a game where the theme is tied really strongly to the mechanics of the game because players understand why they're taking certain actions because they can relate that to the real world and say, oh, if I was really in this situation in the real world, yes, I would be trying to do this thing. I would be trying to take this action. So it's easier for the players to intuitively pick up a game and understand it. Um, and also easier for the players to connect with the game emotionally because they really get invested. If they're playing a game about farming, even if farming is not a real sexy, exciting topic, if the theme is tied really strongly to the mechanics, they'll be emotionally invested in their farm, right? And try to make their crops grow and try to do the things they need to do on their farm. And so, so they'll engage with the game in a stronger way uh, if the theme is really tied to the mechanics. So um, starting out, uh, if you guys are interested in designing board games and card games, um, I would recommend kind of having a mindset of being a theme first designer when you're starting out. Uh, this is my game Brew Crafters, which is about running a craft brewery and brewing beer. Uh, this is coming out this summer from Dice Hate Me Games, uh, and this is intensely theme driven. So this is a good example of this. I uh, was on a brewery tour at uh, Dogfish Head Brewing in uh, Milton, Delaware. And uh, Sam Calagione, the owner of Dogfish, was giving us this tour, and he was showing us, uh, you know, we're installing 18 new barrel tanks over here, and here's our new $3 million computer brewing system, and here's our new oak barrel aging system that we put in, and you know, the new bottling line, and we're growing, you know, 120% this year in our sales, and, uh, and I was just amazed by everything I saw, and at some point over the course of that brewery tour, I said to myself, I want to make a game about this. And so I was very focused on the theme of um, building a craft brewery from the, from the ground up and brewing beer. And so I went home and specifically designed the mechanics of the game to match that theme. How would a real, if I was a real craft brewer starting out with a new brewery, what would I need to do to grow my brewery? What are the things I would need to accomplish? Uh, and so I designed the mechanics of the game specifically for that. Um, and I'm incredibly excited about this game. I think it's going to be very successful because the theme is so strongly integrated with the mechanics of the game. They support each other. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about making it easy on yourself. If you're starting out in design and, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, how do I, you know, how do you get going? How do you just sit down with a blank sheet of paper and start designing a game? You know, how, how do you do that? Um, and so there, there are ways to make it easy on yourself. Uh, one is borrow from other games that you already <coughs> play and love. Um, and two is create a variation of a game that you already know and play and love. So whatever the game is, uh, if there's a game on your shelf that you play all the time with your friends and you really like that game, take that game and modify it a little bit, right? If there's something about that game that always irked you, well, I wish this thing didn't work this way, I wish it was a little different and it worked that way, <coughs> write new rules for it and create new components so that it works the way you want it to work, right? So take something that's already existing and just change it a little bit, add a little bit something to it, and you already have a base to start from. And so you can start kind of feeling what it's like to design different components for a game and come up with new rules and test those rules against an existing system. Uh, and so you don't necessarily even have to start from a blank sheet of paper. You can t pick a game off your shelf that you already play and just add something to it or change something in it. Um, I did that with, uh, with this. Does anybody recognize these cards at the bottom of uh, the screen here? Does anybody know what these are? I know Michael knows what these are. 
Okay, has anybody ever played the game of Ricola? Fantastic game. You guys should definitely play it. One of my favorites. Um, Agricola is, um, uh, is a game, it's actually about farming, um, and uh, I've been playing this game for years, I love it, I've got a huge group of friends that play it, and when I was kind of starting out in design, um, I did this, this decks of cards in the games, um, uh, these, they're called occupations and minor improvement cards, and so I decided to design my own deck, my own deck of cards that you could actually use and substitute in for the cards that were already there in the game. And this was one of the first things I did as a designer, right? I didn't create a whole new game, but I created a new deck to fit and work with an existing game. And then I also did the other thing that I talked about, which is kind of design for yourself. So when I was creating this deck of cards, I themed the deck of cards over the geeky things that I love and that I, I get really excited about. So um, does anybody recognize um, the... Does anybody recognize the first card here? It says the hand of the king. What's that? Anybody? Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones? All right. I'm going to give out a, a, a couple of prizes for these here. So uh, Game of Thrones is right. I heard it from you first. This is a, a reusable shopping bag from a Labyrinth Game Shop in Washington, <laughs> D.C. Here you go. Yeah. Um, all right, so Hand of the King, Game of Thrones. Now, they get a little bit harder after that, okay? Um, marine biologist. Take a guess. <laughs> Take a guess. It is Seinfeld, yes. There's an episode of Seinfeld called The Marine Biologist, but you already got it back. Uh, all right, let's... Um, all right, excellent, though. Yes, Seinfeld is marine biologist. Um, next one, two-step. Okay, that's not what it was for me, but all right, that works. Anybody? It's, um, it's a song. Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews Band, there you go. I'm a huge Dave Matthews Band fan, so I, about half the cards I created for this deck were based on songs by Dave Matthews Band. Here's a, a you can come pick that up later, a bag for you. Um, nice, uh, I'll get it to you, don't worry about it. Um, and then the, fi the final one, um, it says the census worker with a heath in parentheses. So I just basically wrote down all my friends and what they did for a living. Uh, and I have a friend named Heath that works for the Census Bureau, so I created a card about being a census worker as an occupation for a recall. So I had a ton of fun doing this. Um, I was designing for myself because I was designing all the geeky things that I love. Um, and I was taking a game that I already knew and loved and played and just adding something to it or slightly changing it, right? So this, I think, is a great example of one way that you can kind of get started um, in board game design and card game design, if that's something you're interested in. Um, you can just, you know, you just start slow, right? Um, and again, do what you love and have fun with it. Okay. Um, Again, making it easy on yourself, constraining yourself. Uh, we talked about this a little bit with theme first design. Um, Dice Hate Me Games, who is the publisher that's publishing Brewcrafters, uh, also uh, ran a contest late last year uh, where they put out an, an open call for designs to the uh, card game design community. Uh, and they ran something called the 54 Card Challenge. So they said, design a game with only 54 cards with no other components in the game. That was the only restrictions. It has to be only and exactly 54 cards. And we're gonna publish one game. So, um, so they ended up getting like 108 entries from the design community and they ended up publishing six, six of the games. And one of the games that they published was a game I designed based on Brewcrafters called Brewcrafters the Travel Card Game, which is a 54 card version of Brewcrafters. Now, I wasn't even really planning on making a card game version of Brewcrafters. It was in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really thought about how to start or kind of what the game would be involved or what the components would be or how it would work. But as soon as this design challenge was announced, right away uh, it became clear to me. And it helped because being so constrained as a designer, only being allowed to use 54 cards, where it sounds like that might be something that would, um, that would interfere with your creativity is actually something that really opens it up. Uh, because when you know you can only use 54 cards, right away there's a lot of things you can't do in the game, right? 
there's a lot of uh, mechanics that you can't use. Um, you don't even have to worry about any other components other than cards. So it really helps to fo it helped me to really focus in on what I wanted the central core of a card game about Brewcrafters to be, and the game came together incredibly quickly. Um, basically designed it in a bottom up. Um, so constraining yourself as a designer, while it might sound restrictive, can actually really help, especially when you're just getting going in design. Um, limiting the scope of your project, specifically limiting the components that you're gonna allow yourself to use, um, can really get your creativity moving and get you designing faster. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then finally, don't, don't force it. If it's not working, put it away and try a new idea. This is something that took me years to learn. Um, I've got one game that I've been working on since 2009 uh, called Stranded, about getting lost in the wilderness and having to survive. I love the theme, I love the idea, which is why I kind of kept working on it, but you know what, the game, I've pitched it to publishers, it's just, it's just not really <coughs> working. And so finally, after a number of years, I finally kind of put the game away and it's in the back of my closet right now. And maybe I'll get back to it at some point in the future. But it took me a long time to learn this lesson, right? Not to force it. If something's not working, put it away, work on a new idea, try something else. Um, maybe you'll get back to that other one uh, eventually. But you know, don't, don't really force yourself through a process if it's not working for you. Um, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times when I do that, when, when I have a problem in a game that I'm trying to solve, and I can't really figure out exactly what needs to happen, what needs to change to solve this problem, when I put the game away and start working on something new and just put it out of my mind, then, you know, a month later I'll be walking down the aisle at the grocery store or something, and all of a sudden the light bulb will go off in my mind, and I'll be like, oh, right, exactly, that's what I need to do to, to fix that game, and I haven't even thought about it for a month. So sometimes when you put something away, kind of get it out of your head and give yourself some space, that allows you to come back to it looking fresh um, and solve some of those problems. Okay, finding um, or starting a design group is really, really important. Um, I would guess that it's the same with uh, video game and digital design, but uh, designing board games and card games is definitely a team sport. Okay. Um, no board or card game that's ever been designed, even though, even though my name is the only name on the front of the box, I'm definitely not the only person that, um, that designed that game, right? Um, I had input from other designers, from all of my play testers that made that game better. Um, and uh, so, so designing games is definitely a team sport. Your games are gonna be better when you're working with other people and getting peer feedback from other designers so it's really, really important to find other designers, um, whether it's just one person or, if possible, a group of people. Um, meet on a regular basis. Uh, my main design group meets the second Friday of every month, and we have, uh, all night, we have dedicated um, prototype testing. We don't play any published games. We just play our own prototypes, and we have some play testers there who are not designers who like to uh, play our games and, and help us test. Um, so we have a, a regular time, which helps me to know by the second Friday of the month I need to get these changes made so I can bring it back and test it. Um, and, uh, and all of my games are monumentally better because of getting input and feedback from other people, particularly other designers. Um, it turns out that game designers are actually really good at giving feedback on game design. So seek out other designers uh, and work with them. It'll be a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and then, of course, you know, having a design group and reaching out just also helps you to network and, and meet more people in the design community, um, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and engaging the design community online. So, uh, again, these are tailored to uh, board games and card games, but I went on Facebook. There's probably about, I don't know, at least 20 different board and card game guild groups on Facebook. I just listed kind of the first five that, that I found, um, and I participate in some of these. So the communities online are incredibly large, even for board games and card games. It's amazing how many people are out there designing board games, card games, dice games, tabletop games. Um, so you can connect with people on Facebook. 
Uh, you can connect with designers and publishers on Twitter. Um, you can start by following me on Twitter if you'd like to. Uh, and uh, and the, the really cool thing about Twitter is like if you're going, if you want to get published, if you want to meet publishers, it's a fantastic way to network with publishers on Twitter because they will actually engage with you and interact with you on Twitter, right? Like the first time that a publisher followed me on Twitter, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then they actually started responding to my tweets and they will are very happy to engage online, I found. Um, so it's an incredibly open and kind of supportive uh, community <coughs> around board games and card games. Um, so definitely there are LinkedIn groups. Um, if you're on LinkedIn for board game and card game support, um, there are podcasts, there are publisher podcasts, podcasts by players, by designers, there's video reviewers, bloggers, uh, there's Board Game Geek, uh, which is the greatest website ever. Um, <coughs> so if you are into, uh, if you want to learn more about board games, if you want to connect with players, if you want to connect with other designers, Board Game Geek is a fantastic site to be on. Um, and the Board Game Design Forum. There's a whole site, BoardGameDesignForum.com, just for board game designers to connect with each other and help each other solve problems and, and workshop ideas together. Amazing. Who knew? I didn't know any of this when I first started designing. But there's a huge community out there. It's a really engaged community. It's a really open community. Everybody's willing to share and help each other. So definitely, um, if you're designing a card game, if you want to design a card game or a dice game, board game, connect online with the, with the community. Okay, so just kind of recapping, getting started. Uh, we talked about designing for yourself, the kind of things that you love and having fun with it. Um, top down versus bottom up design. Um, making it easy on yourself, constraining yourself, giving yourself limits. Uh, finding or starting a design group and engaging the community online. Um, any questions at this point before I move on? Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about being a better designer. So now you've gotten started. You're kind of you're designing some board games, some card games, tabletop stuff, um, and now you kind of want to take it to the next level and really be a better designer and create higher quality games. Um, so we're going to talk about doing your research, matching the mechanics to your theme. How does it really work in the real world? We talked a little bit about this. Going to touch on it a little bit more. Um, my informal um, formula of one hour of playtesting equals one day of designing. Um, simplifying your designs, getting rid of exceptions, and playing published games and fixing them when they're broken. Okay, um, so doing your research and matching the mechanics to your theme. So right now I'm working on a game called Homebrewers which is about homebrewing beer, and this is a thematic prequel to Brewcrafters, which is about running a craft brewery. So uh, my game Homebrewers is in the prototype phase right now. It hasn't been signed or picked up yet, but I'm still in the development phase of creating homebrewers. So I'm not a homebrewer myself, although clearly I have an interest in craft beer, right? Um, but I'm not a homebrewer myself, so before I started designing this game, I went out and I did my research. So I found some friends and some people in the board game community that I know that are homebrewers, and I went out and I brewed with them for the day. Um, and so I asked a million questions, and I learned everything that I could about homebrewing beer, and the type of equipment they use, and the process that they use, and what they consider a successful beer, or what they consider a good homebrewer to be, and how they judge a homebrewer, and whether they're a good homebrewer or not. So, I went out and immersed myself in the world of homebrewing in order to design a game about homebrewing beer. Makes sense. So doing your research um, and matching the mechanics to the theme. So you'll notice here on the picture on the left, uh, you can see this is Jonathan, who's the homebrewer that I was working with. And this is his mash ton. He's mixing uh, the mash to get ready um, to, uh, to put in um, to get ready for the boil. Um, and so you can see that there's a card in the game that's called All Grain Brewing. And you have to do this if you're brewing with all grain. And you can see there's a card in the game, and it kind of looks similar to the actual equipment that he had. Um, and then the picture on the right is his 10 gallon system. Um, and that's the boil where he's actually boiling and brewing beer. Um, and you can see the card in the game is 
representative of the real equipment that he's actually using when he's brewing in his 10 gallon system. So, um, so, so doing that research really helps, right? Because, I mean, I could try to create a game about home brewing beer, but I don't really know how it works, and it's going to be much, much easier if I understand the process and understand what home brewing is all about um, when I sit down to design a game about home brewing. And then the process is just that much smoother. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you don't even have to think about, well, that's not how home brewing works, so I'm not even going to consider that mechanic for this game. Um, you know, that's maybe another reason why I don't design games about zombie pirates. I've never seen a zombie pirate. I don't really know how they really work. I don't know what it's like to be a zombie pirate. So I, I like to kind of design systems that I can see and touch and feel and, and, and experience. Um, uh, that's just me. Okay, so um, one hour of testing equals one day of design. You can sit in front of your computer as a, and you're trying to create a card game or board game. You can sit in front of your computer, you can sit in front of a table with components, paper, for an entire day, right? For eight hours and trying to figure out, well, what should the value of this card be? And what should this mechanic be? And should I have four different, should I have four different colors of beans? Or should I have five different colors of beans? And, you know, what is the math behind it? And, and what's going to be balanced? And, um, and how long is this game going to take to play, and where are the pro So you can sit in front of your computer for a day trying to figure this stuff out. Or you can do the minimal work necessary to get a prototype to the table and play it, even if it's with your sister, brother, boyfriend, neighbor, anybody. Just get it to the table and play it. Or play it yourself, if it's a type of game where you can play kind of both hands or both sides. Play the game yourself and test it. So. Um, you know, I found that testing the game for an hour is worth worth an entire day of sitting in front of your computer and trying to figure it out for yourself. So get your design to the table as soon as possible and test it and find out what's, what's working and find out what's not working and go back and fix what's not working. Um, and much better than trying to figure it out with spreadsheets or whatever you're doing, trying to figure it out um, you know, on, on your own before you're actually designing. Um, when you do run into problems, the answer is almost always to simplify. Um, whoops, I think I have some pictures here. Yeah, so this is uh, this is me playtesting home brewers, uh, not home brewers, uh, brew crafters last summer, um, and um, this is okay. So the answer is almost always to simplify. So this is Marsden's Mechanics, my game that is published and out and available. Um, and by the way, the um, uh, compliments of the publisher, Nevermore Games. Everyone's going to get a coupon code for 50% off Marcin's Mechanics today if you do want to order it online. Uh, so make sure you stick around for the second half of the presentation, and I'll hand those out. Uh, but the answer is almost always to simplify. So Marcin's Mechanics is, uh, at its heart, an economics game. It's a supply and demand, buy and sell game, um, where you're trying to make the most amount of money, or in the game, cause. This is a game that I first, this was before I kind of realized that theme first was the way to go, and I kind of started with the mechanics first and said I want to make an economics game, but I didn't really have a theme to go with it. Uh, and so my first iteration of this economics game, this was years ago, uh, that I tried, that I printed out, and I had my friends over and we played, and um, we ended up needing calculators to keep track of the scores in the game, because clearly the math was not right, and we ended up having like, I'm going to sell 127 shares of this for $18,746, and I had to get out a calculator. And if you ever have to get out a calculator for a tabletop game, you probably went off somewhere, right? That's probably too complicated. So, um, so the answer is almost always to simplify. And so I kept chipping away at this game, chipping away, simplifying, 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 um, until I got it down to uh, the components that you see today. Uh, the board in the middle there is, is the market. There's seven goods. They all value between $1 and $9 in price. Uh, and so, um, so when you run into a problem and something's not working with your game, the first instinct you're going to have as a designer is to add something to the game to fix it. Okay? Well, something's broken over here, so I need to add a rule to fix that and to balance it out with the thing that's over here. 
99 times out of 100, the correct answer is not to add something over here, it's to take something away over here, okay? Take out a rule, take out a component, take out a whole section of the game, okay? Try to simplify first to solve your problem before you think about adding something in to solve your problem. Almost always is the correct answer. Um, and then designing to get rid of exceptions. So if you are designing uh, tabletop games and you're writing down the rules to the game and you find yourself writing things like, or if you're explaining the game to someone else and you hear yourself saying things like, except if, or unless, or only when, or in the case where, if you have a lot of these qualifications in your rules, this thing works this way, except when you do this, then it works another way, or only if you do this, then this thing happens. When you, when you hear yourself saying that a lot, be careful because it could be the sign of a lazy designer, okay? Or if you, if you, uh, if you buy a game and you bring it home and you see a lot of things like this in the rules, be very, very skeptical of that. You want to try to design to get rid of those exceptions. Anytime you have an exception to a rule in your game, it's more mental energy that the player has to spend on remembering when the thing doesn't work the way that it usually works, and it's less time the player can spend, and less mental energy the player can spend on really engaging with the game and actually having fun with it. Okay? So trying to design these types of things out of your rules and out of your game uh, will make your game more streamlined, it will make the players engage with the game, it'll probably make the game flow better. Um, and doing that extra work to find out how can I get rid of this exception that I've built into the rules is certainly worth your time as a designer. Okay? And it'll make your game better. Um, and then play published games uh, and improve them by making house rules. So playing published games. There's an old story that I used to hear, someone asked Stephen King, the, the writer, the horror writer, someone asked Stephen King why he's a good writer. Okay, and does anybody know what he said? Why he's a good writer? So someone asked Stephen King why he's a good writer, and he said, because I read a lot. Because he reads other books, that makes him a better writer. And it's the same thing with designing games. Same thing with designing tabletop games. You'll be a better designer if you're playing a lot of different games and exposing yourself to a lot of different themes and mechanics and rules. Um, so this was very hard for me to do. I mean, I have my games like Agricola that I love, and I used to play like you know a few times a week. Over the last couple of years, I've forced myself to play new games that I've never played before, even if it's not a game that I think I'm going to particularly love because it makes me a better designer to expose myself to all kinds of different systems and games. Um, and we talked a little bit about, um, we already talked about kind of making house rules, or if you have a game that you play and that you love at home, but there's something about the game that you don't really like, there's one thing that kind of feels weird about the game, change the rule. Change the rule and test it working a different way and see if that makes the game better. Um, I encourage you to do this kind of thing all the time at home when you're just having game night with your friends. Um, these little things about, well, if I change this, what is the effect on the rest of the game? Doing these little things as you're playing published games, sometimes it'll make the game better, absolutely. Just because a game is on a box and a shelf doesn't mean that it's perfect, right? There are things that can always be improved. So I encourage you to find those things in the games that you're playing and make those changes and improve your games. That will help you also as a designer. Okay, so just kind of recapping being a better designer, we talked about doing your research, matching mechanics to your theme, um, playtesting as early and often as you can, uh, the answer being to simplify and to design to get rid of exceptions, uh, and playing, playing published games. Okay, so now you've gotten started as, as a designer, you're a better designer now, and you've got a couple of prototypes that you think, hey, this is pretty good, this is, I, I think this is good, I think maybe I can get published. Um, and so you want to improve your chances of getting published. So what are some of the things that you can do? Um, we'll talk about knowing your publishers, going to conventions, the Unpub program, which is so awesome that it gets its own slide. Um, not worrying about your ideas getting stolen 
which is really tough for a new designer, but we'll talk about that. Getting unbiased feedback, looking for the right uh, questions, and looking for the right feedback when you're doing playtesting, and what's in a prototype. Okay, so um, knowing your publishers and going to conventions. Uh, if you are designing a game about, um, if you're designing a game about um, farming, don't approach a company that only publishes historical war games and ask them if they're interested in publishing your game about farming, because they're not. And you're just wasting your time and you're wasting their time by trying to get them to publish your farming game when that's not the type of game that they publish. So make good use of your time um, when you approach publishers. Um, only approach a publisher about your game if you think that it's the type of game that they're going to publish. So research the games they've published in the past. Is this something that will fit well into their line of games that they might be interested in publishing? Okay. Um, a game like uh, Looney Labs that makes Flux. Has anyone played Flux or heard of the game card game Flux? Okay. Um, so Looney Labs, which is a local company in College Park, Maryland, um, they make these little card games, right? And they're kind of like, kind of silly, not very strategic little card games. Well, Looney Labs, I didn't go to them to see if they would be interested in publishing Brewcrafters, which is this huge game that takes up the entire table to play. They're, they're not. They're just not going to publish that game. They publish little card games. So be smart about approaching publishers. Uh, and go to conventions and game events. I cannot stress this enough. Every game that I have gotten signed so far, I have played with the publisher at a gaming convention. Okay? This is the best way to get your tabletop games published, is to go where the, design, where the publishers are, go to local gaming events, go to conventions, take your prototypes there, corner the publisher and ask them for five minutes of their time so that you can show them your game, more often than not, they'll say yes, and they'll give you at least five minutes, and if they're interested in those first five minutes, they'll sit down and play the entire game. That is the best way to get published. You can try to email back and forth with designers and send your prototype out, even if they agree to take your prototype. It might sit on their desk for six months before they get around to playing it, or you can go where they are and actually play it with them live, okay? Best use of your time, best use of your money, going to conventions, finding those publishers that you're interested in, and playing your games with them there. There is no shortage of um, the number of local, here to the DC area, um, game events, or wherever you might live and be going next year after you graduate. Gaming events, gaming conventions. Just here in the DC area, there's the Games Club of Maryland, um, which has events every day of the week, pretty much, in the DC, Maryland suburbs. Um, so you can find play testers, you can go and play published games. Um, uh, there is the Baltimore Brews and Board Games, which is up in Baltimore um, at, a, at like a bar where they do um, games once a month on a Saturday, and they invite, publish, uh, they invite designers to come and to play test your game there, and you can kind of get the word out and show your game there. Um, that's just two, there's about 100 more. Um, local conventions here to the DC area, uh, EuroQuest, which is up just north of Baltimore in November. Uh, it's a few days every November. It's about um, Euro gaming um, and uh, like a resource management type of strategy games. There are publishers that are always there. There's PrezCon, which is a gaming convention down in Charlottesville, Virginia every February. There's always publishers there. I played what became Marsden's Mechanics with Nevermore Games at PrezCon. Um, and two weeks later, they called me up and said, we want to publish it. Okay. So um, that's, a, that's a great place to go. Um, the World War Gaming Championships, which are in Lancaster, Pennsylvania every year, which is only like an hour and a half drive from DC. There are publishers that are there. I've pitched games to publishers at the World War Gaming Championships. So there are a ton of really good local events that are cheap and not going to cost you a lot of money to go to where the publishers are and where small publishers are. Um, and, uh, and so go, go where they are. Uh, of course, then there's the big conventions uh, like Origins and like Gen Con, which are probably two of the biggest dedicated tabletop and board gaming and card gaming uh, cons or conventions each year. Uh, and I mean, all the publishers are there, right? Hundreds of publishers are at Gen Con and Origins. 
Uh, and so um, go where the publishers are, bring your prototypes, do your research ahead of time, know who's going to be there, and make appointments with them to play your games. And now, Unpub. Uh, Unpub has a special place in my heart. This is a program that's been around for about five years. You can check it out on unpub.net. Um, this is a program that's solely dedicated to independent game board, board and card game tabletop designers in getting those games in front of publishers and getting those games published. Okay. Um, they have these Unpub minis, which have spread all over the country. This started in Delaware, so there's a lot of stuff on the East Coast, all up and down the East Coast, but it's spread all over the country. Um, they have these Unpub minis at game stores all over, all over the area, um, where you, know, you can go and you have a prototype and you sign up to bring your game, and playtesters will be there, and you can get feedback on your game, and maybe a publisher will be at one of these minis, and maybe it won't, but at least you can connect with other designers there, and you can get feedback from playtesters there, um, and you can meet other people that are in and around the Unpub program. Um, and then once a year, they have their big Unpub event, uh, which up until now has been in Dover, Delaware. I think that next year's event, it's always Martin Luther King weekend, I think next year's event is going to be in Baltimore, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but follow the news from Unpub, follow them on Twitter, follow them on the website. Um, if you have a board game or a card game or a dice game and you are interested in getting that game published and you are anywhere remotely close to the Baltimore, Delaware, DC area next Martin Luther King Day, you should absolutely go to Unpub 5. Next year's event will be Unpub 5. Um, this is a picture of me with Chris Kirkman, the owner of Dice Hate Me Games at Unpub 3, two Januarys ago, where I played Brewcrafters with him. And he emailed me about a week and a half later and said, I want to publish Brewcrafters, okay? So again, going to conventions and events where the publishers are and playing games with them there, the best way to get published. Um, Unpub 4, which was a few months ago, this past January, um, at least seven, and that might be an old number, it might be more by now, at least seven games got signed that weekend by publishers at Unpub 4. It, Unpub is an entire weekend, three days, just designers and publishers playing games, pitching games the entire weekend. Okay. There are other events like Protospiel like you might have heard, which is more a similar type of thing that tends to be more in the Midwest and the West. Unpub is kind of more here on the East Coast, but spreading all across the country. So <clears throat> if you're interested in networking and meeting new people and in getting published, get involved with the Unpub program. Okay, uh, don't worry about your ideas getting stolen. This is really, really tough. It was really tough for me as a new designer, right? So I come up with what I think, what I know is the greatest idea ever, right? And I have this game that's totally unique and nobody has ever thought of anything like this before and it's gonna make a million dollars and I don't wanna show it to anybody because I'm afraid that they're gonna steal my idea. Right? First of all, that doesn't happen. It just doesn't. There's a lot of work that goes into developing a game and bringing it to market and doing all the marketing for it and doing all the art for it and a lot of cost associated with that. And a publisher is not interested in ruining their reputation and getting sued and ruining their business to steal your game idea, which may or may, may, or may not be a successful idea anyway. Um, and you will never, Remember when I said that designing games is a team sport and your games will inevitably get better when you show them to other people and when you test them with other designers and with other players? Um, your games will not get better unless you're willing to show them to people and to test them. Um, so this is something that I've slowly kind of gotten over, this fear of one of my designs being stolen. At this point, I have no fear of that. It's not gonna happen. It is so much more worth my time and energy to put my game in front of as many people as I possibly can and to get as much feedback as I can to make the game better, to get it ready to be published. Um, if you never show your game to anyone, it won't get published. Don't worry about your design getting stolen. I, I honestly have never heard of that happening in the, the board and card game. I've never heard of an example of literally someone's design just getting stolen and taken. Um, getting unbiased feedback. Um, 
So you can you can play test with like your roommate, and you can play test with your friends, and you can play test with your boyfriend and girlfriend, and your mom and dad, and your brother and sister, and that's all great, and you should do that. But then you should play test with other people that you don't know. Um, you're just gonna get better and honest and truer feedback from people who aren't afraid of hurting your feelings, who you're not friends and family with. Um, so absolutely critical to once you're ready to go to the next stage in playtesting and you've got an idea that you like, you need to get it place tested with people that you don't know, which is, a, which is another reason why things like Unpub are great. Or going to your local game store, Labyrinth Games in Washington, DC, um, are very supportive of designers and you can reserve table space there and just go and set up your game and kind of pull people in and have them play test your game. You need to find people that you don't know to give you feedback on your game. And then when you're getting that feedback and when you're play test, when you're play testing, you need to be asking the right questions and you need to be looking for the right thing. So while I'm running a play test of one of my games, while I'm watching what's going on on the table, I'm just as much, if not more, watching the other players' faces as they're playing my game, okay? Because I'm checking for emotional response. I'm checking for an engagement with that game that I can see in their faces and see in their body language. I'm interested to see if they're kind of leaning back away from the table, kind of checking their watch or checking their phone, or I'm interested to see if they're kind of huddled over the table, very, very focused on their next move and what they're gonna do. Um, that kind of feedback is just as important as what a player actually tells you after the game. Okay. Um, and then after the game, you do want to ask some questions, but you want to ask the right questions. So asking questions like, did you like it, is, in my opinion, a useless question to ask somebody after the game. Because they're going to go, yeah, yeah, I liked it. What does that tell you? That doesn't tell you anything. So you need to ask specific questions. Um, did you think the game was too long or too short? Why? Um, what did you find was the most interesting decision you made during the game? What did you think was the kind of most boring part of the game that maybe could be cut out or taken away? These kinds of specific questions about different parts of the game are much more valuable than just a question like, did you like the game? Or rate it on a scale of one to 10. Um, and then what do you need to do to actually make your prototypes ready to go and talk to publishers? Um, well, you need to make them respectable, but you need to show that you care, um, but that's about it. That's really all that you need to do. Uh, and so, you know, my prototypes are just printed on my home printer on my computer. Um, I don't definitely don't pay for any art or pay for any kind of professional prototyping. Um, if you have a game that has a board in it, you don't need some expensive, fancy folding chipboard that's got a you know, hinge on it or anything like that. Um, you just need something, maybe like cardstock or something a little bit thicker than regular paper that unfolds nicely, that looks presentable, um, but you don't need to really spend a lot of money on your prototypes. Definitely don't need to spend money on art. Um, you know, just go to Google Images, get what you need for your prototype. As long as you're not reselling that and trying to make money off of it, that's fine. Um, and um, uh, because the publisher is, if the publisher publishes your game, they're gonna redo all the components and all the art and everything anyway. So you don't need to pay for that. Um, you just need to make it respectable enough that you are proud to put it in front of the publisher. And that's, that's really it. Um, I, you know, I print all my stuff on cardstock, on paper, um, and then the other bits that I need, like little cubes or something that I need for the game, um, there's a great website that I use all the time, eaieducation.com. Um, it's a teacher resource website. They've got tons of great little bits and counters and things that you can use in, in board games, as little chips and stuff like that. Okay, so, um, so in, in summary, everything that we talked about today, um, I would say make it easy on yourself. Um, start slow, constrain yourself. Um, you don't necessarily need to start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, create something and then test it as soon as possible and then simplify it and then test it again and then simplify it again and then test it again and then simplify it again. Simplify it again. Uh, bring your games to conventions when you're ready to pitch them to publishers. Go to Unpub, 
And most importantly, again, the most important thing I can say today is design for yourself. Um, do what you love, have fun with it, and you can't go wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, thank you for your attention. Um, I do have uh, some stuff for you guys, some little gifts which I'm going to hand out. Um, but I think what we're going to do now, since I know this is like this is like an, an eight-hour class or something, right? It's like, I think that's what Lindsay told me. Um, so we have plenty of time. So it's ten o'clock right now. Um, so what we're going to do? Uh, oh, by the way, uh, so keep in touch, please, after the presentation. Uh, here's all my information. I'm going to give you um, cards as well. And there's some shameless plugs at the bottom for my games. And definitely, I'm going to take questions in just one second. Um, so what, we're, what we are going to do is we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to do a design activity. Um, and we're going to come back, and we're going to um, fix some games that aren't really fun games. Okay? And we're going to make them fun. We're going to split up into little teams and do that. Um, and when you come back from uh, the short break is when I will give you all of the free stuff. Okay? So that's your incentive to come back. Um, but before we do that, I would love to take any questions that anybody has. Yeah. Ben? I do one of those kind of curious what the BGG there is. Oh, uh, Board Game Geek. So BoardGameGeek.com. <laughs> um, that's my username on Board Game Geek. So if you want to write me a message through Board Game Geek, that's... Uh, so uh, when you get into board game and card game designs, everyone's business card has their BGG username. Um, but I was also wondering, um, what do you think of uh, sites and means like thegamecrafter.com? Like, are those good tools for creating and developing or distributing the games? Or um, I guess if you wanted to sort of distribute the print and play sort of fashion. Yes, yes, it can be very useful. So, um, uh, so Ben mentioned thegamecrafter.com, and there's a number of other websites and services like that where you can pretty much upload your game, and they'll make more of a professional kind of prototype and have it available for other people to either purchase or to download through the Game Crafter. And you can actually kind of sell and distribute your own game by yourself through these websites. If that's something you want to do, absolutely. Um, I know a lot of designers that use that kind of as a tool for getting their game out there to get it peer reviewed, right? So um, they'll, they'll design a game, upload it to the Game Crafter, and then say you know, to other designers, please go download this game and play it and give me your feedback and let me know what you think about it. Um, some people actually try to kind of sell games and make money through the Game Crafter. I don't know of anyone that's really making a lot of money doing that, but if you want to get your name out there, if you want to get your games out there, if you want to get people to play them and review them and give you feedback, certainly consider <laughs> using a service like that. They did have they had some nice templates for all sorts of different kinds of card decks and things like that. They they do so they can do some art for you, right? And you can kind of customize and make your stuff look a little nicer than you would just kind of at home. And they kind of do a little bit of higher quality production and art and stuff. So um, yeah, definitely something to check out and consider. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, <coughs> one if you oh, too much preamble. Tell me about your experience um, doing playtesting with some of your uh, designs, and you know, like how hard is it to take feedback, or how have you found that whole process of, um, like, you know, you have your grandmaster plan and the thing you're making, and then of course you're horribly wrong, probably once you get into people. Um, do you have a story you can share, or anything like that? Um, of cool. just. General like playtesting gone wrong or just uh, yeah yeah because because yeah. I guess you, you made it sound so easy where you you know you make your prototype then you give it to people and then you you fix it right um, where I, I don't think that's how a lot of people encounter it's difficult right yeah you, you didn't talk about how hard it is to <laughs> yeah. to, to, to kind of get feedback yeah. um, I guess one example the first thing that comes to my mind is what I mentioned before about the first time I tried my economics game and it kind of went horribly wrong because the numbers and the math was all off, and it was really ridiculous that we needed calculators to play this game. And halfway through, I was like apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I put you through this, and you're wasting your time. And they're like, no, we're here to have fun, you know, whatever. And they were kind of having fun with these ridiculous numbers that we were creating. Um, but, um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, you know, that's the point of playtesting, right, is to find out what's wrong with the game. And so 
you know, in my mind, when I design the game kind of in my head and I have an idea of what it looks like and then I put it down on, on paper, I start it, you know, and I print out a prototype, in my head I'm convinced that the game's going to work perfectly the first time I play it and there's not going to be any changes that are needed. I mean, that's never, ever, ever the case. Um, if you do think the game is perfect and doesn't need any changes, you're wrong. It does. Um, so, so yeah, that, but that's the point of playtesting is finding those things that are wrong. And so, you know, will I playtest a game for the first time at something like Unpub, where it's people that I don't know that are coming? Probably not. I probably the first playtest. I either play it myself or I play it with like good friends who know that it's a first playtest of the game, and there are going to be things that are broken that we're going to have to fix on the fly. But once you get it to the point where you think the design is stable and you're ready for that um, kind of more uh, true or real feedback from people you don't know, you should absolutely move to that step as soon as possible. But yeah, things are not going to work the way you think they're going to work the first time. They're going to have to be fixed. But that's fine. That's encouragement. Get, be encouraged by that, not discouraged by that. Right? So, oh, I found this thing that's broken, and I know how to fix it, and I can go fix it. Also, during your first playtest of the game, don't be afraid to change things on the fly, right? So you're playing halfway through the game, and like this one thing is clearly unbalanced, because this one move, this one action that someone can take is way too powerful and it's clear, then change it in the middle of the game. Say, okay, instead of this being worth four, it's now worth two. And then keep playing the rest of the game, right? That's what playtesting is all about. So don't be afraid to kind of make those changes on the fly to, to be able to get better feedback. Does that help yeah, a little yeah. bit? Um, anything else? Questions? Okay. Okay, so um, let's take um, like a, just like a five minute water and bathroom break. And then it's 10.09 now, so come back you know, about 10.15. And um, then we will split into groups for about 45 minutes and do this design activity and uh, fix some games that are broken. All right? Okay.